Okay, hello everyone. We're here, this is Dent Live. I'm Jason Preston, one of the co-founders of Dent, along with Steve Broback, who's also here. We did a series of podcasts live, broadcast over the internet about a year ago called Dent Live with a series of guests. And this is a continuation of that concept. This time we are hanging out with Monica Guzman. Monica is, uh, along with um, being married to me, is a, an amazing award-winning journalist. She's also an entrepreneur. She's a co-founder of The Evergrey here in Seattle. Uh, and she is also uh, an upcoming author. She's got a, a book that will be coming out in the next, what, year and a half. And uh, Monica, wel welcome to the show. And maybe if you want to elaborate on any of that, or maybe just say, say hi and, and what the book is, if you want, that'd be great. Go for it. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to be here. Uh, I am working on a book about curiosity and staying curious in very divided times. So quite timely. Seems everything these days has something to do with that theme. It's a big universe. I also want to thank Jason for uh, a delicious gin and tonic that I am enjoying right now. Always good to ply your guests with alcohol. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I need one of those. <laughs> I know. Darn guys, social distancing. <laughs> yeah, well, Sorry, any, Steve. Any excuse. Any excuse. <laughs> well, 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 actually, it's funny because we're going to talk about that. In fact, that's one of the things on the list. We might as well start with it. Um, is this idea of, you know, right now, today, which is May 12th, 2020, we've got this situation in the United States where most of us are in some form of quarantine, stay home, stay healthy uh, in some form or another. But just because those restrictions are going to be, you know, be lifted over the coming weeks and days doesn't mean that our behavior is going to go back to normal. Uh, and I think a lot of, for me, a lot of that normal behavior, which we're not seeing right now, is is stuff that amounts to relationship building that we do just sort of automatically in our daily lives. You know, one little example is we're, you know, we have the house right next to us. Uh, the new owner closed on Saturday, has gone in and out of his house a couple of times, doesn't have any furniture there yet. But, you know, normally, Monica and I are the type of people who would be very social about having a new neighbor. We would be, we would go knock on the door, we'd say, hey, come into our house, tour around, we'd, you know, we'd bring a gift. Um, you know, these kinds of things are how we just naturally just, you know, build relationships, build that sort of back and forth of, uh, in, uh, of becoming friends and, and building tighter, tighter relationships that build community. And, and so I'm curious from the perspective of building community, either in neighborhoods or, or beyond kind of like, like Dent, um, you know, what is, what is this, what do we all think this is going to look like over the coming months, right? Knowing that people are going to be afraid of other people, uh, of being close, you know, it's like I, it, to different degrees, right? Because everybody's going to have a different level of tolerance. But that's my, that's sort of my, one of the questions that I've got, like I said, just this week, you know, I've sort of waved at our new neighbor, but I haven't spent any time. I haven't, I haven't talked to him. I haven't, been over to his house. I haven't, you know, none of that stuff that I feel like I would normally do. And I, I don't think that that's going to change in two weeks just because the governor says I can get a haircut. Yeah, no, I think that's right. There's a lot that's been disrupted because of the quarantine when it comes to all of the ways that we interact socially that at least in my lifetime, Steve, I think you would say in your lifetime, I mean, we've never experienced this level of disruption to those norms around, well, of course, I'm going to go to a restaurant and hey, there's my friend and I'm going to go to the coffee shop where I'm a regular and, and there's all these relationships. There's really two, two kinds. There's the connections we make with spaces, right? We all live in the Seattle area. There are connections we make with spaces. They're not just somebody's small business. They're meaningful to us. That restaurant where we love the uh, fried chicken, Frank's Oyster House in, uh, oh, yeah. in our part of the woods or whatever it happens to be. There's also the other category, which is relationships with people. And there's a lot of ways that just normal behavior that we can't do um, very naturally connects us with each other in just bit by bit by bit by bit and, and forms these relationships over time. Uh, Jason, when I was thinking about your question, I thought about four gifts 
that have come to us and our family in the last couple of days Mm -hmm. that are taking on a new form. It's like the way that gifting and relationship building is adjusting to meet the realities of the quarantine. And I'll go over real quick what these gifts are because I find them fascinating. One is our son's best friend has decided for a school assignment, the assignment was to write a letter. He has decided to write a letter to our son. And so his mother said, he would like to gift him that letter. Can we come over and just drop it off in your mailbox? And I said, yeah, that's great. Now, would, if they had both still been in the classroom, writing letters may never have been an assignment. And the opportunity to get in the car and take a trip to show your friend that you wanna give him a letter may not have been a thing. Gift number two, last night, I cooked up uh, an Indian style vegetable curry. It was delicious. And I drove it to my friend Susan's house. Susan is a fellow denter, actually. She's also a brand new mom. And she had a meal train going. So I signed up for the meal train and delivered this hot meal. Um, And then we ended up talking for an hour at a safe social distance at her house. Um, I saw her newborn son through the window. And it was so much more meaningful than had we just gotten on the phone. Now you would have done a meal train in, I mean, anyway, right? I mean, the, yes. so that's that's not a, a, a different, I mean, I guess the difference is really very slight because the meal trains we've done in the past, it's like drop off the food and leave, right? Because it's a new, new family, new that's baby. That's what's different. That's what's different. I think that if it had been a meal train in ordinary times, it would have been drop off and leave. And in fact, that's what I expected. And Susan sort of showed me like, no, 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 stay and talk, right? Because there's more need for that. Uh, The third gift was yesterday, uh, our friend Marika dropped off some books that we had talked about um, just in conversation. She drove quite a ways uh, with her husband to make deliveries of various things. And one of those stops was here at our house. And again, wearing our masks at a safe social distance, we took that delivery as an opportunity to have an in-person conversation, which was great and bonding. Uh, And then this one's really interesting. On Mother's Day, a friend of ours named Ixchel, who has not been like the closest friend that we see all the time, um, a little more kind of outer network, her children decided they wanted to make roses and cards for the mothers that they know. And so they dropped off a flower at our house. She just let me know, we're, we're gonna drop off a flower at your house. Never would have happened outside the time of quarantine and COVID, much more meaningful than a Facebook message. So those are four really interesting examples where the kinds of gifts and gestures um, are showing up and I think in a different way because of the scarcity of social connection in the time of COVID. And what I th- one thing that I think is really, and then Steve, I'd, I'd love to hear your reaction too, but the one thing I think is really interesting about that is none of those things I don't think are mediated by the internet, right? In a way, I would I would expect to see that this kind of that it's like oh well you know zoomograms or you know what I mean like that there would be some new internet mediated gifting habit, but but those are all things that that could nothing about them is new in that sense, right? Yeah, I mean, not to say that there aren't, there might be some new ways that, I'm sure there are, new ways that people are gifting and such through the digital environment. Those stand out to me oh. because they still feel, they feel so much more significant because all of that interaction has been dampened. But hopefully there are, I don't know, Steve, have you heard of, what do you- Well, mean? I think people are, there are a couple things that relate to this. One is there are you know, a handful of people or a percentage of people who just say, oh, I'm loving this. Mm. You know, the way things are right now is just dreamy for me. But let, let's assume that's just a small percentage of the population, because I think it probably is. It is, yeah. Um, there's one other question that sort of really, I think, affects your mindset as you go through this process of trying to maintain connection. And one is, do you view this as a temporary anomaly or do you view this as you know the the new now this is the way it is uh going forward and i think there's a lot of people in both of those camps because i I think in terms of you know for your mental health i think it's a lot easier if you go well okay this will loosen up and we will largely go back to normal but there's a lot of people go oh my gosh it'll never be the same again so um 
regardless of that, for the short term, what you are seeing, uh, and I'm taking note of it, is people figuring out how to navigate around the edges of what's legal, what's appropriate, what's inappropriate, to get to some degree of connection. And um, one place, uh, a neighborhood I was in recently, is they were all about tailgate parties. So cars, you know, would back up to each other and lift do the tailgates up and people would sit at a social distance and everyone would bring their own food and their own drinks and they would commune that way and it would be significantly like us, oh, it's kind of like the old, the old days. Um, the other thing is I believe that people are going to start to push the boundaries and um, move into areas that 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 are maybe not are not okay right now and we, you know i've heard stories about one household will decide to sort of link to another household and they will become a closed entity um and they'll you know they'll take that risk for the short term in favor of having a better life in the in the long term so i believe people are coming up with all kinds of inventive ways to have real actual face-to-face -face connection because Unlike what we're doing right now with Zoom, and I'd, I, you guys may have done more homework on this than I have, but the whole Zoom fatigue thing, which is a, a legitimate physical oh, yeah. situation, is alleviated in a more social dialogue, like a little bit more like what we're having now. But a lot of people are just like, oh man, Zoom is work, and yep. real face to face is not. So anyway, that I don't know if that helps answer any questions. No, or... it does because Zoom is so often. When we say, oh, let's make an appointment, it's yeah. because there's something to do. And so that's gonna feel like work. The interactions we have with our friends, they might be appointments in so far as like, oh, I'm coming over to dinner, but we don't think of there's an agenda, right? And a lot of a lot of Zoom meetings get created because there's a kind of agenda. What I've what I've recognized is thinking about these deliveries, right? These ways that people are gifting within the same geography. Um, is that they they have become a really interesting excuse to just have a casual conversation. Right. And right. and I I love that. Nobody says, I'm gonna deliver your book and we're gonna talk for 45 minutes. They just say, I'm gonna deliver your book, and then you happen to talk for 45 minutes. And I think the fact that it is unplanned and unscheduled is part of why it works. And it feels like it substitutes for something we've lost much better than a Zoom call. Yeah, in a way, you know, I wonder if the gift there is attention, right? Time. Mm -hmm. Time and attention. I'm I'm equating the two, I guess. But yes. uh, you know, we're not going to go drop things off at everyone's house, right? Right. We're not going to. I don't know. There's. It's interesting. The, but yeah. yeah, there is. And to bridge it to kind of Steve, what you were saying a moment ago is, I do. One of the things that uh, that I I'm charmed by is the way that we as people experiment. I mean, especially in you know. Right. In the Western countries, United States, where there's a little bit more freedom to do it, but it's just that there is untold millions of experiments going on in parallel yep. about how to uh, how to be mentally healthy, how to have a social connection experience in the in the context of a health crisis. How you know, and over time, the ones that end up being the smart way to engage, right? Because it's the right ratio of risk and mm -hmm. social or, you know, mental health or wh whatever yes. the case may be, or community health, right? I should say not mental health, community health, right? Like how do you, how do you find a balance where you can have a safe and effective way of building relationships through that practice of giving and receiving yeah. on a community level, but maintain safety? Right, which is it's a serious thing. It's a really important aspect of it, and th those will. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking about uh, you. I'm just thinking about giving, etc. So you know, we have a we have a Seattle-based band that my wife and I we just we love, and they play. You know, and it's the side project. Yeah, oh, tell love them, the side project. There, a... you know, the 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 dent band, so to speak. They were going to play at the conferences here, etc. Well, they're on the road. You know, we you know we'd go to a a bar or restaurant they're playing in a hangout. And it was like, you know, the highlight of the week. And now they're playing outdoors in a um, spot in California where they've got their, their, their mobile, um, 
you know, they're mobile and on the road. So they're, um, and what they do is they beam it out there. Okay, so it's Facebook, Facebook uh, Live. And so they play a great set and we're, you know, watching them and listening to them. And then we applaud, but they can't hear us. Yeah. So now it's, okay, what do we do? And everybody's going into Messenger and it's sort of booming up. And of course, we're, we're Venmoing them tips. <laughs> so it's become a little bit more, you know, commercial. But that is definitely one where the, there's half of the, at least half the gesture, them hearing applause yeah. is gone. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's a gift. That there's no feedback. You need- If you can't the, give. Yeah, you can't have the feedback, and that's such a key thing. Jason and I watched some time ago a video of a, a stand-up comic that was doing a set from his house on Instagram, oh. on Instagram Live. And again, you don't hear laughter. You just see a person tell jokes, and it's so much less funny. I discovered this via a, a New York Times article from someone who said it was the new funny, and I, I'm like, I'm sorry. I, can't. I hope not. <laughs> it's, man, it's really hard without seeing the feedback, the, the the way that performers eat up the fuel from an audience and connect with them. And then that becomes the performance. It's never just been the performer by themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I want to move us to the next to the next uh, sort of topic. And it's a prompt. This is we're venturing into a bit of a gray area because I want to I want to talk directly about uh, what is something that is essentially and and by necessity political. There's a lot of conversation that I hear about how with with everything that we've just been talking about in an oblique way that we are in various states of quarantine and we have you know various levels of we have to stay at home and just the response in general to the new the novel coronavirus COVID-19. People are talking about how it's too bad that it's being politicized. And I, I think that it's it's one of those twists of you know it's like politics is is necessary it needs to be politicized when when something when something puts our values in conflict with each other the values come in conflict as a nation as a country the work of politics is to resolve that conflict of values because we still have to live in the country together we still have to go to work together we still have to work as a as a group we have to exist as a nation and, and it's you know it's become a dirty word and in some ways it feels very dirty to a lot of people but but it's unavoidable this is a this is going to be politicized because we have values of freedom values around um you know whether it's you know is it is it american culturally to wear a mask uh you know it's very much about our identity as as Americans, are we a federalist country, or are we a? Do we have a, a single national response to things? It's to my mind, it's it's unavoidable. And so the question has two parts. First is from each of you: Do you agree with that statement? Right, that this is inherently politicized because it has a conflict of values within it. And and if you agree with that, what's the right way for us to go about that conversation? Because I don't think we should just throw stones and say oh it's political or these are the facts you should believe or we should trust mm -hmm. this or that other expert i think we as a you know individuals need to have a way to have a conversation with neighbors with whom we might have different levels of tolerance for i mean i, I witnessed the other day actually it was a month ago two months ago i have no idea time warp somebody was saying you know oh it was they were saying hi and they were saying, oh, I, I'll give a hug. I don't care. And I wanted to say, like, wait a minute, that's a two-way street. Yeah. You can't just hug someone because you don't care. They, you have to know where they stand, <laughs> right? So that kind of crystallizes this idea for me. And so that's my prompt. And either oh. of you, I don't care who. It's Steve, in, it, it, yeah, yeah, Steve can go for it while I take a sip because it's oh, politics. Oh, God, you're so lucky. Um, it is. Mm, it's but we're talking mostly significantly these days about policy and policy it's that's political i mean m many of the big decisions being made right now are being made by politicians and it's affecting all of us so yes it is absolutely political and there's no way to escape it so to say oh gee they're politicizing it that's like of course they are 
what else are you going to do? Now, you can argue they're politicizing the science, but I and I think, oh, okay, well, that's a little more something open to debate. However, pol science is political too. So um, anyway, yes, so I agree completely. There's no escaping it. What l we have to talk about this is a political, as a, as a policy manifest, manifestations of policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. I um I believe kind of deeply in the principle that um, meaning is in people, not words. I think when when the accusation comes out that this is being politicized, the meaning is more about someone is putting this argument in the deeply divided channels that get us to yell at each other. I think that's oh, kind of what oh, is often meant. Or they may just be saying, people that don't agree with me are making this political. Exactly. Usually if someone accuses someone of politicizing something, it's hardly because they're on the same side. <laughs> You're right. right. It's, it's, it's usually an accusation lobbed at the other side and conveniently we don't apply it to our own side, you know, whatever happens to, to be the, the thing. But with something like politics, I think it's useful to take the word and it's one of those where it's like, okay, what does this really mean? And you know, it, what it really means is people ticks. Politics is just people, <laughs> you know? Policy is people see. It's the, <laughs> policy is the decisions we make uh, based on the negotiations among people around how we live together and how we build the society. And politics becomes a dirty word because so many of those negotiations, to Jason's point, are about fundamental underlying values that we are terrible at talking about. And I mean, it's awful. More, it's more than that though, um, because it's, sorry, now we're getting to that whole holism versus reductionism argument. I, I think politics is more than people because there are all kinds of policies that exist that nobody, a lot, nobody likes. Um, you know, the one, uh, you know, a confiscation of people's belongings because they've been arrested and not convicted of something. Pretty much universally, everyone agrees that shouldn't happen. Yeah. But that policy exists. I think the, uh, that person in Southern California, I think it was Southern California where he was paddle boarding all by himself, you know, way offshore, nobody around him. And he comes in and gets handcuffed and hauled off to jail. You know, that I think seems everyone, like less safe. <laughs> right. And what I'm saying is, I think everyone agrees, every individual would go, okay, well, that doesn't work. So, but that's policy. So anyway, I'm just, I'm, I'm splitting hairs here, but I, I think it's po policy manifests in ways that the, that the public choice, you know, the public has not made that choice. So if I can frame that into the, the question, your sort of take might be that the way to have conversations with people about it is in is in policy is in how are these how are these values that come into conflict put into action right there's not there's not really a productive argument to be had where you know your risk tolerance and my risk tolerance or your view of what it is to be american and my view of what it is to be american are at odds that's fine, we can agree that they're at odds, but now we have to actually talk about what is the practical application of that. That's the productive conversation, is what is the policy that results from that interchange? Yeah, I think, I mean, okay. that's where the rubber meets the road is what are the actual policies yeah. that are that not only legislated, but enforced, because then we're also dealing with, um, you know, there's the, is it a barber shop up in Snohomish? where the barber goes, I'm opening up. And the sheriff says, okay. And then yeah, there's- well, We don't need to go like, down the rabbit hole, but Elon Musk yeah. is trying that in California. Right. I don't know how Elon that's Elon Musk, <laughs> I'm opening. If you're gonna arrest somebody, arrest me. That's going to be a huge experiment. Yeah. And now policy will also be affected by, oh, wow, are, are the taxes, are we gonna lose our tax base? Because they'll migrate to where the where the, you know, it's a looser thing. So sorry, I'm not yeah. trying cool. to- Cool, that's fine. I don't... No, it's cool. It... I, I, I did want to say that I have a different take. For me, I don't think you can have the conversation productively about what is useful for everyone until you have a good conversation about what is meaningful for different groups of people. So I think that a lot 
I happen to think and believe that a lot of the issues we're facing are because we tend to avoid um, acknowledgement that people come into everything with different values um, and a different, what I would call like a values stack. Right. You know, it's not that people don't care about this thing you care about. It's that they care about something else more. Oh, you're... And if you don't stop to discover what that something else is, you're just going to think they're a monster and you're never going to be able to figure out what's useful for both of you. Well, that Steven Pinker chapter I emailed you the other day, yep. Monica, is exactly, exactly that, where he talks about the uh, sort of the conflict of visions is really based on this. It's a fundamental set of values and belief in how the world works that to the two different camps manifest as different policies. And right. Yeah, I, I really agree with you on that because I also think in terms of debate, people talking across each other, a whole bunch of that can be eliminated by just saying, look, here's, here's where I'm coming from and why I'm doing that. Um, personally for me, I just throw out, oh, I'm an econ major. So that's why I sort of have this worldview of, so yes, me, and you, you and I have gotten major. into it sometimes. Like you and I have gotten into it, into some things and I love when, you, I think you do a great job of framing it as, well, this is where I'm coming from. And as soon as people do that, it's like a check-in. It's like we come back to the same page. You know, the temperature cools down and we can see more clearly again every time you do that. It's really, really Well, in this good. book, a, a Conflict of Visions that Stephen Pinker likes so much does that. He frames both, basically the two major camps as sort of, he calls them constrained and unconstrained thinkers. And he, I think, um, promotes both pretty even handedly in terms of why both have merit and, and how to better understand if whatever camp you're in, how to understand the people that are in the other camp. So anyway, yes, I agree completely on with your, what cool. you're saying. Where, where are you coming from? Right. So we're coming up on the end of our time here. And I think something that would be fun to do and that we can do is uh, they were, they're all great questions that we could have a long discussion about, but I think it might be a fun teaser. Uh, beforehand, we talked about each of us kind of have a question of the week, if you will, just something that's been coming, you know, th that we're curious about this week in the theme of maybe Monica's book, so to speak. So why don't we go ahead and share each of us the question that we brought. And we can each, if we want, give a moment for the other person to just give a very, a very, very brief sort of reaction to it. And then we can uh, wrap up for today. So, uh, Steve, why don't we start with, with yours? Do you want to share your question? Well, I'm going to start with a super fast question that you don't know that I was going to ask, because now I'm going to, is I would like to hear from Jason and Monica. Is this a temp in your, and believe me, no one knows the answer to this. So I'm not saying there is an answer. Just what does your gut tell you? Is this is the beginning? This is just the early stages of a very permanent transformation of how we engage with people. Or is this, it's an anomaly, and in a few months or a year, we're going to be back to normal? Which of those two extremes are you more in line with? Oh, that's tough. I think, I think there are going to be some permanent changes, but I do think that a good share of what, of the behaviors we've lost socially will come back, but the range in my head, in my gut, is something like within three to four years, not next year or within months. So what, one year from today, we'll be at sort of 80% fluidity of engagement with our, with our with people? Mm, the, the, the thing that my gut tells me about that is yeah. I think about, well, the Spanish flu lasted two years and had many waves. And I can't yep. rule out that yep. the same thing won't happen here. Right. Until we get a vaccine, we just have no idea. If it's, you know, oh, I know we have no come idea. And go. I'm just, yeah, okay. So, yeah. so I'm thinking right. two years out the road, at, down the road at minimum. Two years and we could be back to, and hopefully we'll be back to normal. Yeah, we may, for example, fewer people may uh, do handshakes. More people may yeah. be washing their hands all the time, right? But we'll be going to restaurants and things. That's, that's the most important thing. Yeah. Jason, what do you think? So it's funny, it's a, I'm glad I'm answering second because it's a total layup to my question of the week, um, which I don't think there's any rule book. There's nothing in the world that says that there cannot be some permanently, permanently threatening, hugely problematic disease for humans. 
you know, for years and years and years, there was polio uh, that, you know, it, it, and people forget that it's not, it's not just, oh, you, you get sick and you recover. It's like, no, a certain percentage of people, it's not just died, didn't die. It's, you know, pol it's paralyzed yeah. or, you know, other serious lifelong neurological uh, or other, you know, kidney, God knows what issues, right? There's yeah. nothing that says that we get a vaccine for everything we want a vaccine for. Right. So if I factor that in, I think that we will, I think that life has been, I think that life has been permanently changed. And I would expect that if you took the temperature four, five, 10 years from now, we will be at 80% of what things of what things we do will look very similar to pre-COVID, and twenty percent will be totally different forever. Hmm. That's I what think I think, it's... and I think that's I think that's true. Even if in the in the in the brilliant scenario where in a relatively short period of time we have a vaccine, it's effective. We manage to maintain some level of herd immunity over the long course. I think that our psyche has been and by the way i'm speaking of the u.s i really have yeah no perspective i think so, so i think psyche helps, unavoidable but. it's changed forever but i think we're at least 90 percent back to normal in two years yeah. and i've no the only re, I, i'm just thinking the psychology of humans is to freak out and overestimate how long something's going to be yeah. a certain way so i've just i think anyway i that's my two cents. What do I? Know? Yeah. So my question. So I, my question of the week is: What behaviors are going to permanently change, right? At least for much of our lifetime. And I like as a prompt for thinking of that. It's like the Great Depression. It's like who doesn't know the story about the people who are, you know, were seventy-five and acting like a depression was around the corner because right. they lived through it, right? Yes. And so that's what I mean: is what are the things that twenty percent, in my view, that's going to be like, oh yeah, you keep your money in a cash box in your closet because. Depression the stock market. approval and savers. That was a thing that came out of that. And I think yeah. I think handshakes and with the denter, all of us denters are very huggy. Yeah. And I think I think and also various regions are that way. Uh, but I think the handshake and hugginess is going to be largely mitigated away from our mm -hmm. sort of ongoing thing. You know what just occurred to me? Um, kind of the opposite answer that I thought I had. Uh, up until now, in this very moment, I've thought, well, yeah, pe fewer people are going to give handshakes. But I've just flipped that in my head because I think actually the more permanent change is people will realize how much it means to be together. And uh, I think that once there is a vaccine, if there is a vaccine, if we can really truly test well and tell who's safe, I think we're actually going to get closer. Yeah, I can see cool. that. I think that's very likely. I would like that for that to happen. We're going we're gonna to value the times we get to spend together the same way that folks in the Great Depression valued the money they had today. Hmm. I'm going to value the time I can spend with my friends today because what if I cannot spend that time with them tomorrow? Hmm. Cool. So, Monica, what's your question of the week? Well, it's a good segue to mine. Uh, <laughs> how can we address the mental health loneliness challenge I wrote, but I could say catastrophe, uh, that we're swimming in? I initially had phrased it as, the mental health and loneliness crisis that's coming. But that's sort of like news speak because sometimes people talk about things that are coming just because we can't measure it yet and no one's written an article about it yet. Mm. We all know people are lonely and suffering now. They suffered last month. There's effects of that happening now. There's no question in my mind we're gonna see the suicide rate go up. We're gonna see all kinds of depression and, and mental health. I mean, economically, we have so many communities and people are devastated. Even folks who are relatively well off. I, I believe social interaction is a basic need. We just never had to put it in Maslow's pyramid, but it's been there the whole time. Um, I'm mm -hmm. very worried about that because again, we tend to not talk about something until someone's measured it. No one can measure loneliness. No one can really measure it. It's still there, we all know it. So I, I wonder just what can we do? <laughs> can we do about that for each other jason don't say gin and tonics <laughs> don't gin and tonics true. for all that one doesn't work for everyone um so i i i think that my guess is that this is a book that i'm going to send out to we'd send a book out to 
dent members. They're called passport holders. You sign up for a, an annual membership. And among the things we do is a book club where the book comes out and we can we have a forum to discuss it and things like that. And it's one, I think I'm gonna send this book out and I've just been reading through it. And it turns out that in the last maybe 15, 20 years, there's been a lot more research done around loneliness in particular and the health effects and and one way to think about loneliness they is proposed in the book is this idea that it it should be thought of like hunger or thirst where you know there is an essential need for human companionship and there's they break it into different ways you can talk about human companionship and when you feel lonely it is your body signaling the way it would if you were hungry that you want food that you you right. need more of this companionship to sustain you in a healthy way. And I think that the other remarkable thing, they've got sort of a bunch of you know individualized stories and case studies. And one of them that stood out to me was basically a phone call a week. It's someone, that's what they needed. And that was enough to get them going, right? And there's, of course, this is written about a time when it was plausible that that person could then get encouraged to go out of the house and go, you know, go volunteer somewhere or do something that we think of as traditional social interaction, which is not available right now and is causing this crisis. But the, it's remarkable the amount that you can get out of a phone call a week. And so I think that my immediate reaction to your question is to not try and overcomplicate the response. You know, we have we can get a, you know, 80, 20, what can, what's the 80, 80% benefit with 20% of the effort that we could do right now? You know, right if up. each of us, yeah, exactly. If each of us picked up the phone once a week and called someone, yeah. you know, if, if all 350 million Americans did that once a week, it's a great idea. I think we could, you know, well, I've got another Pareto difference. aspect here. There is, it's not 20. Well, it, there's probably 80% of the population is, at a much, 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 much reduced risk compared to the other 20%. And um, I'm copying out here because I'm not, I'm not offering anything in this moment to help the, that 20%. But I think a significant percentage, mil many millions of people in that 80% will determine that they are willing to take the risk of communing with others that inherent in communing with others to do that. And so I think for them, and that may be that may, the logic behind that choice may be, you know, 100% rational. So um, I'm copping out by saying, I do think there's a sizable percentage of the population that will, it will resolve for them. And what I'm really worried about is the other 20% that are going to absolutely have to isolate for their, for their own survival. Yeah. And what do we do? What do we do for them? And I think yes, phone calls are one. Absolutely. It, this makes me think real quick about the Zoom fatigues that you brought up earlier, Steve, and how often Zoom meetings have agendas and they're about what you do. You know, in a way, friendship is a tension with no agenda. Friendship is being together, not doing together. And right, right to the extent that folks are making a lot of appointments, that may not. You, they may see a lot of people but that may not actually get to loneliness at all because people are not really seeing them. They're seeing an agenda. Right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, you can be surrounded by people and still be lonely. So yeah. on that cheerful note, uh, <laughs> we shall, <laughs> we'll, we'll wrap this up. Thank you very much, Monica, for taking the time uh, this week with us. We'll be doing this again next week. And I look forward to the conversation and the questions we have then. Sounds good. Thanks all. Thanks guys.